Welcome to Pine Island United Methodist Church, where we exist to reach people with God's love, transform lives, and change the world. My name's Kaylee Vita. I'm the pastor here. We are just so glad that you're joining us today for worship, whether you are here with us in person or whether you're joining us online today. I have a few announcements for us. First of all, we'd love for you to sign those black books in the pew and fill in your information to let us know that you are here today. Second, I just want to remind you, you have one more chance to see uh, the show in our student series. We've done two last weekend, um, was Lacey's show, and this weekend is Mo's uh, show that she directed called Ophelia Lives. One more time, today at 2 o'clock, you can see that show. If you haven't already, you don't want to miss it. These two shows have been phenomenal. Uh, they just are really wonderful shows, and I would encourage you to come today because... Nicole is in the show, but I bet that you won't recognize her. So, you got to come and see if you do. Um, and then I'll remind you that the Summer Sunday matinees, they start next Sunday afternoon, August 28th. We have our first one at 2 p.m. And those shows will also be over in the theater in the LEC. Our first show is um, Key Largo. Bob says it's the perfect time to watch it because hurricane season. So uh, be sure to put those on your calendar and come out next Sunday, and Bob will be our wonderful host for the afternoon. Uh, just to give you all an update, we did have our church conference this past Tuesday, and our DS was here, and we unanimously passed uh, going forward with applying for the loan in order to do the, the repairs that we need to the roof um, in the LEC office in Wesley Hall, and then the repairs and resealing of our parking lot. So, um, Bob Carlson, our chair of trustees, has moved forward with that process. And then um, school's back in session. So that means that we're packing food bags. The backpack program is back in full swing. And um, as you might have seen in the midweek message, the newsletter that came out, Karen is in need of some donations of food. And there was a list in there, but I also have a printout for you out on the welcome desk if you need that. It's a list of the food items that she needs for those backpacks. And you can pick one of those up and do your shopping and bring those and put them on, um, on the table under the bulletin board out in the lobby area. Uh, I will just remind you, I'll say this so that you all hear it, no peanuts or peanut butter in like crackers or granola bars. The school is a no peanut um, school because of allergy situations. So, all right. Will you pray with me, please? Lord God, whose power and mercy have extended to all ends of creation, pour your love on us this day that we might be healed and be made ready to serve you by serving others in this world that you have created. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, I'm Bob. I sit on the back bench over there. And um, uh, periodically, I'm asked to sound the conch shell. We live on a tropical island, and I've been on a lot of tropical islands around the world. And many of them start their church service with a conch shell. Now, why is that? That's because for many years, up until about 20 years ago, they didn't have church bells. They couldn't afford them. And they didn't have clocks, they couldn't afford them, and most people didn't have wristwatches. So when do you know that it's time for church to gather from the villages and the farms? The conch shell. And we sounded conch shells here in these islands all the way up until the 1940s. I remember uh, that happening. So uh, we're going to start our service today the old-fashioned tropical way. Happy Sunday. Welcome to church. May the Lord bless our service. morning. It's exciting to be here for my first Sunday. Uh, our opening 
him is gather us in. Stand if you are able. Your name is 
is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on seeing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart. So I bet all of you have a hard time listening sometimes. Don't worry, I do too, you can admit it. So you're probably thinking about listening to grown-ups, but how often do you listen to God? Well, God is telling you things all the time. Today, Pastor Kaylee is going to talk about a couple of different stories, and one of them God encourages someone to go and do great things, even though he doesn't think that he can. In the other story, some people try to tell Jesus himself what he can and can't do. Isn't that kind of crazy? Well, Jesus tells them that God told him what he has to do, and that what God says is the most important thing. Now, you probably aren't going to hear a literal voice telling you what to do. God works in all kinds of ways, so it's always good to be paying attention. And when God tells you to do something, that is the most important thing to listen to. Let's pray. Dear God, help us always to listen to you. Help us pay attention and remember that you are the most important thing. In Jesus' name we pray. pray. Amen. Amen. Now let's go to the nursery, everybody.
just for everybody's knowledge, in about two and a half weeks, I'll be even worse, because I'll actually get the ankle replacement. <laughs> okay. Um, that says morning prayer by Kathy Rose. Okay. The thing of it is, is that when you're praying, you're using words, and your words are very important. Um, I'd like Bob and Jim and Vicki and Ava. Where is Sonnet? And Sonnet, please stand up. It's okay. I'm going to do the word parts. Okay. And Lois and Pastor and Chris and Vince. Okay. Do you realize how much a difference their words make? When you come into the congregation, when you come into this building, when you sing the songs, God is using these people. So that may say Kathy doing the morning prayer, but these people started when you first walked in the door, when you first started the service. And I think we need to recognize them. Okay. Ah. Uh, what happened to Mo? She went back to, okay, Mo should have been standing too. Okay, you guys can sit now. Now I'm going to start the prayer. <laughs> no, it's just I feel really strongly about helping others see the people that make our congregation the congregation it is. Okay, please pray. Lord, we come to you this morning with our words. Some of these words we speak to each other. Some are read to us. Some are spoken to us. Some of the words we sing and some come to us in a play, in a book, in a movie. Some words we receive and send on our phones or our computers, our news newspapers or TV. And through all these ways and through our prayers, you want to speak to us. And you want us to speak your word to others. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. What a lie. Words are powerful, Lord, and you know it. They have the power to hurt, the power to build up, the power to heal. As John says in the first chapter, the first verse of his gospel, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus, in today's gospel, uses his words to heal. He stops in the middle of his teaching to use the words that you gave him, Lord, to bring healing and new life. And in the Old Testament lesson, you tell Jeremiah that he will be your spokesperson. And Lord, you won't give him the excuse that he's only a child, because you will give him your words to say. I thank you, Lord, for your words. I thank you that you use our youth and our playhouse to teach us how words can build others up, not just tear people down. I thank you for our greeters, our ushers, and their words of welcome. I thank you for our pastor and how she studies your word to bring a message from you. I thank you for your musical words and those people, Vince and Chris, also Carrie and Sebastian and Nicole, who helped us to sing and praises to you. And Lord, most of all, I thank you for this congregation and these visitors, their smiles, their greetings, their words of encouragement, hope, and healing. And Jesus, when your disciples wanted to learn how to pray, you taught them and us to say, please join me. Our Father, who art in heaven, please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. join us in singing for the beauty of the earth it's also found in your hymnal on page 92 you can stand stand if you're able As our ushers prepare to come and serve us uh, today, um, I wanted to share a quote that I came across this week. I said, God provided the tithe as a benchmark to help us put God first in our lives, to help us put all else in proper perspective. I went on a little hunt and found that um, Deuteronomy 14 talks about a tithe. And the Israelites are told to set aside a tithe. And we talk about that tithe all the time, but that means a tenth. They were to set aside a tenth of their crops, their first fruits. And doing this was to teach them to recognize God as their provider. And that is why we worship together. In this manner of, of gathering our tithes and our offerings for the Lord, it's to remind us to put God first and that God is the provider in our lives. So you can see the various ways that you can do that today on the screen. And as our ushers come forward, let me say a prayer for us. God who provides everything we need. We thank you. Thank you for blessing our church. Thank you for providing what we need to do the ministry, your ministry, on this island to your children whom you love dearly. As we give our gifts today, God, we pray that you will multiply them, that we might do even more 
than we can imagine with these gifts. God, we love you. We pray all of these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first chains are gone, I'll be set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The Lord has promised good to me, His words my hope secure. He will my shield and portions be as long as life endures. My chains are gone. I'll be set free, my God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing. Shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine. But God, who called me here below, will be forever mine. Will be. stand if you are able. Thank you. Please stand. Señor 
your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children pray. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. morning. This is the call of Jeremiah 1, 4 through 10. The word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. Luke 13, 10 through 17, Jesus heals a crippled woman on the Sabbath. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and the woman who was there was crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, There are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Gail, for reading our scripture this morning. And thank you, Kathy, for that thoughtful prayer. Now, we have been on quite a journey this summer. We've met the prophets Elijah, Elisha, Amos, and Hosea. And we met Captain Naaman and Little Maid. In Luke's gospel, we've met the man who was possessed by many demons, the Samaritan village, which rejected Jesus, the 70 who were sent out, the Good Samaritan, Mary and Martha, the rich fool, and we learned along with the disciples how to pray. We've been learning how to be disciples, how to be in our right minds and laser focused on Jesus. We discovered that the kingdom of God is for everyone, even those who we might consider to be our enemies. We're, we were reminded that God has standards by way of Amos's plumb line. Standards that entail loving God and loving neighbor. God does not want us to be distracted by many things, but instead wants us to focus on the one thing that is God. We talked about the scandalous love of God, that love that goes above and beyond to save us, even us, who are all too often unfaithful. 
We can go to God anytime. And when we persist in prayer, we have God's promise that we will receive just what we need. The presence of the Holy Spirit. We learned about being rich toward God. But we were also reminded that God always provides. God always dwells among us. God is always faithful. God always loves us. And that is good news indeed. Now today, we turn to our final prophet in our series, Jeremiah. Now we will spend two weeks with Jeremiah, which isn't nearly enough, but I'm sure we'll revisit him again sometime. Our previous prophets were all 8th century prophets, but Jeremiah's ministry occurred about a century later. After that northern kingdom of Israel has been destroyed by Assyria, and the Babylonian empire has now become a threat to the southern kingdom of Judah. Now today's reading is a description of Jeremiah's initial call to becoming a prophet. But before we get into today's reading that started in verse 4, there's some important information about Jeremiah in verses 1 through 3. These verses establish Jeremiah's context. We learn under which kings Jeremiah served as prophet, just when he began, and for how long he served. He received his call, which is our reading for today, in the 13th year of the reign of King Josiah. Now, King Josiah was a reforming king. He was deep, deeply loved by the people. He was one of the good ones. Jeremiah became a prophet during Josiah's reign. He served throughout his reign, even through King Jehoiakim's reign, who was one of Josiah's sons, and into the 11th year of King Zedekiah's reign, another of Josiah's sons. Now, according to the New Living Translation, it was August of that 11th year that the people of Jerusalem were taken away as captives. And neither Jehoiakim or Zedekiah were considered one of the good kings, hence Jeremiah being take, or Jerusalem being taken captive. Now, all told, Jeremiah served as a prophet for about 40 years in Judah and, Je and Jerusalem. A very long time. And Jeremiah's was a harrowing call. He is not called the weeping prophet for nothing. He experienced tremendous personal turmoil and rejection throughout his life and ministry. The book of Jeremiah is long, and we are only going to cover a small piece of chapter one and a small piece of chapter two. But if you were to read the entire book, you would learn that few listen to Jeremiah, even fewer become his disciples. And he spends much of his life in struggle and loneliness, without a wife or family, with many screaming that he is a traitor to Judah and an outcast to his people. Now, I tell you all of that not to discourage you, but... Because knowing the trajectory of Jeremiah's life, knowing how it goes and where he's going to end up, makes this call story of his even more rich and meaningful. I don't think, I hope, Jeremiah didn't know where he would end up when God called him and told him that he was to be appointed as a prophet to the nations, that it would get that bad. After all, the king at the time was a good king, a reforming king, one who was loved by the people. But even so, Jeremiah did not want the job. Like Moses before him, who tried to give God every excuse in the book, including supposed poor communication skills, Jeremiah was sure he was not the man for the job. Jeremiah claims that he doesn't know how to speak 
because he is only a boy. He uses his youthfulness as an excuse. But just like God would not let Moses off the hook, neither does God release Jeremiah. Excuses will not be tolerated. It is God who sends and commands, and for that reason, Jeremiah is told not to focus on his youth and his perceived inability. Rather, he is to focus on obedience and dependence. He is to do what God tells him to do and do it trusting that God will accompany him on his mission. You see, God calls us to do what is impossible on our own, so we learn to depend on God. Too often we are bound by our own excuses. We are too young or too old, too shy, too loud. I don't know how to do that. I'm not gifted in that area. I can't speak right or say the right thing. I'm too busy. The list goes on and on. But God says, no, no more excuses. I have given you a job to do. In Jeremiah's case, God put out God's hand and touched Jeremiah's mouth, saying, I have put my words in your mouth. Now, you might not feel God's hand directly on your mouth, but let me assure you, God is with you. Let me say that again. God is with you. If God has called you to do something, no excuse in the world is going to stop God. And this makes me think of our youth. Now, Nicole came to me with the harebrained idea in, I don't know, late May, early June, maybe, that we should do a VBS this summer. Now, keep in mind, she already had two weeks of pilot camp and two weeks of theater camp planned, but she convinced me that it might be worth the try and that she could pull it off. So she talked to the youth, who were excited about the idea of being part of VBS, leading some of the groups and stations. And then fast forward to the week of VBS. Now, I'm in the office every day, so I know that they have been planning and they've been having meetings with Nicole about VBS. I know they've been working hard, but I had no idea just how hard they'd been working <clears throat> until I saw VBS in action. And I'll tell you, I couldn't be more proud of this group, and there's many others that aren't here today, of this youth group. They led small groups, they taught lessons, they set up stations, they cleaned up stations, they sang songs, they did motions, they flopped up and down on the floor. Now here's my point. They could have said, we can't lead VBS. We're too young. We don't have experience. We don't know how to do those things. And maybe some of them had those thoughts, I don't know. But if they did, they didn't stay bound by those thoughts. Now, I don't want to speak for any of them, but I don't think that any of them had an encounter where they felt the hand of God on their mouth. But I would say that God definitely put God's words in their mouths. God was with them. God called them to do VBS. And they were obedient, and they were dependent on God to provide exactly what they needed. And my friends, God did. God was with them. God provided. And if there was any sense of being bound by their age or their inexperience, God set them free from it. And then we got to celebrate the fruit of that two weeks ago when we had our worship service, that celebration service when kids and families showed up and they sang songs and they danced and they shared their stories and a little bit about the week that they spent together with us. And we all praised God together. 
And now Jeremiah, he didn't praise God in that moment when God touched his mouth. No. <laughs> Instead, he received his marching orders, and they weren't exactly good news. He was told that his mission was twofold. First, he's to announce God's judgment upon nations and kingdoms. Specifically, he's to pluck up, pull down, destroy, and overthrow. And then second, he will proclaim a positive new beginning, build and plant. And throughout the remainder of the book of Jeremiah, those six verbs are found over and over again with the metaphor of tilling and planting being perhaps the main point of the book. Now the point is this. The ministry of the gospel is hard work. Sometimes it involves plucking up and pulling down notions that we and others might have that we are too young or too old or too whatever. Sometimes it involves working to destroy systemic problems within our society so that we can get closer and closer to truly living into God's kingdom here on earth. But sometimes it involves building and planting which are still hard work. Now, poor Jeremiah, though, he was called to be an agitator, which is also where we find Jesus today in the gospel story. It's a common motif in the gospels. Jesus comes into conflict with the religious authorities concerning Sabbath practice. Now, specifically in today's reading, Jesus heals a woman on the Sabbath, And then he rebukes the religious leaders for criticizing the healing. Jesus, the agitator. But for me, Jesus isn't the main character in this story. The woman is. She, like so many others, is unnamed. But that does not make her any less important. Now, I feel for her right from the start. She has spent 18 years of her life bent over, unable to stand up straight. I've had my share of back problems over the years, and I've spent time bent over, but that was nothing compared to this woman. It's believed that she suffered from something that modern medicine calls ankylosing spondylitis, It's an orthopedic condition where there is severe forward flexion of the spine. And those who have this also suffer from neck and back pain, fatigue, difficulty breathing, and problems related to inflammation of the aorta. Now, I would guess the woman in our story also perhaps had feelings of frustration, vulnerability, and isolation. Very likely, she could not look anyone in the eyes without straining her neck somehow. She had gotten used to just seeing everyone's feet, always looking down. She is bound by her condition, her own body. Unlike Jeremiah, she isn't making excuses. She is quite literally bound and limited. But that does not stop her from coming to the synagogue to hear this traveling preacher teach. And it would seem that in the middle of Jesus' teaching that he catches a glimpse of this woman. He sees her. And I want to stop right there and think about that for just a minute. Jesus sees her. And when he sees her, he stops what he is doing And he calls her over to him. This is a big deal. Because in that culture, people who had visible impairments of any kind were most likely ignored, looked down upon, seen as charity cases. They were the people that you did not necessarily want to see. But Jesus not only sees her, he calls her to him. And I love this painting by Barbara Schwartz illustrating their meeting, their meeting because I imagine Jesus doing just that, bending over so that 
She doesn't have to strain to look up to him, sharing her burden. And then he says some of the most beautiful words to her. Woman, you are set free from your ailment. You are set free. And as if it couldn't get any better, then Jesus touches her. And that is the moment when the power passes into her body that she stands up straight. Straight. She has been bent over for 18 years. And in that moment, she stood up straight. No longer bound. She praises God. Now, because it was the Sabbath, the synagogue leader is not happy. And because of this, we often paint him as the bad guy of the story. But he isn't really a bad guy. He's stuck in legalism. And he's missing compassion. However, compassion trumps legalism nearly every time. Compassion should come before all else. You see, the, the synagogue leader, he isn't entirely wrong. It was against the law to work on the Sabbath. You might argue, depends on your definition of work. But Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11, is clear that there are six days to work. But the seventh is to be a Sabbath to the Lord. And on that day, they are to do no work. The text This text in Exodus references the story of creation, that God created for six days, and on the seventh, God rested. So that is what they are to do. But you see, Jesus is arguing about the Sabbath from a different perspective. He's using Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 12 through 15 as a reference. Again, it's clear there are six days to work, the seventh is a Sabbath, but here there is to be no work so that their slaves may also rest. Instead of referencing the creation story, Deuteronomy says to remember how they were once slaves in Egypt and the Lord brought them out, setting them free. In this case, the Sabbath is all about freedom, being released from bondage. And that is exactly what Jesus did for this woman. (coughs) Sorry. In there. The synagogue leader argued that there were six other days that she could could have come for healing. But my friend, because it is the Sabbath, she must be set free on this day. And what a glorious day it was. She and the crowd who witnessed the miracle rejoiced and praised God. Now most of us, we know what it's like to be bound. Perhaps you've been bound or are bound. By excuses, like Jeremiah. I'm too old. I'm too young. I'm not smart enough. I'm not fun enough. Perhaps you are bound by lies that you have either heard or that you tell yourself. I'm not good enough. I have nothing to offer. Or perhaps you know what it's like to be bound by circumstances that have diminished and wounded you. You might be bound by some sort of impairment, like the woman. No matter what binds you today, know this. You don't have to stay there. God wants all of us, as children of God, to experience freedom. Now, for just a minute, I'm going to ask you all to do something. Will you close your eyes? 
take a deep breath and just relax for a second. And imagine whatever it is that is keeping you bound today. Once you have that in your mind, imagine Jesus standing right in front of you. He's looking right at you, just like he looked at the woman. Now, hear him say to you, you are set free. And then feel his touch. Maybe it is on your mouth as Jeremiah. Or maybe it's somewhere on your body like the woman. Maybe it's your head, your shoulder, your arm. Wherever you need to feel his healing, freeing touch today. Feel it. Experience it. Let it straighten you today and loose what binds you from praising and serving God fully. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for setting us free for speaking freeing words to us, for touching our bound up minds and bodies. We get so caught up thinking we can't be used by you because of excuse after excuse or reason after reason. We are bound so often by our own thoughts. Forgive us. Today, we are reminded that you want each and every one of us to experience freedom. You set us free so that we can praise and serve you and point others to you and your freedom. And may it be so today. Amen. Now, having experienced those healing words and that touch from God. We're all going to stand and praise God together. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song. Deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. Can you sing this? I'm no longer a slave to fear. I
As you leave here today and go through your week, hold on to that truth. You are a child of God who has been set free. You are no longer bound. Go fully praising and serving God. Amen. freedom today. Thank you for worshiping with us. I'll see you next week.